What are you watching for this weekend in Oregon, Washington? Uh, you know, for me, I want to see who, which of the quarterbacks plays the clean game. Like Michael Penix has put up spectacular numbers for the last two years. Um, when they played UCLA, it was that Friday night game and UCLA, I think people didn't really know what to make of them. You know, DR, DTR was obviously super streaky, but Penix had a couple of turnovers and they, that actually just got behind. Cause that was about the only way they were getting slowed down. Um, you know, his, his TD interception rate ratio is remarkable at Washington. It's not Caleb esque, but that's the bar right now, right? Those guys are playing mm -hmm. sky high. I think. And we'll find out this. I think Oregon has the better personnel on defense. I feel like Washington has the more explosive offense. Um, I can't wait to see this. Is I mean, because I think both are legit playoff caliber teams, you know, but who knows? I mean, it's not like Washington's competition has been great. Like they played Arizona and Arizona's pretty good and Arizona hung with them. They played Michigan State at the time. I, which was just the dumpster fire of all dumpster fires at the time. So I don't know how much you could read into it, but you know, you got two guys who have reinvented themselves in the PAC 12, you know, it's been pretty awesome. Cause it's like, it's a little bit the inverse of Jaden Daniels who mm -hmm. who's reinvented himself in the sec. So um, it's, I can't wait. Yeah. Bruce, we're going to talk to uh, our, our colleague, Mike Kuchar about Washington's offense a little bit later, but I feel like, you know, we've done, we do our Heisman straw poll. And I hope none of the Heisman Trust is listening. But like Bo Nix has been on my ballot consistently, but he's like sort of we've seen him kind of drip, drip, drop off of people's off of people's ballots. And I'm like, he didn't do anything like mm -hmm. no disrespect to Brock Bowers. But when you look at Oregon's offense, I feel like they've got an opportunity if they have a huge game and win this game that he's sort of back on the front. What do you make of, of, of Oregon's offense in this ball game, And, and what have you seen from them? This it's, season? it's like Bo Nix Awareness Month, right? Right. Evan? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, a little bit. I feel like I'm <laughs> I'm like I haven't seen anything to take him off of there. Maybe I maybe I'm biased. I saw him in person and, and love what I saw, but the dude the dude can play. No, no doubt. I mean, it's been, you know, there were moments where I remember he was the five star guy, you know, at Auburn and played early and and had some moments, but then there was a lot of other stuff that wasn't, you know, I don't think it was all him, but mm -hmm. um I think the hard part, and I'm glad you brought up the Heisman straw poll. You know, like Caleb by default, even when last week, you know, the first half wasn't very good from him, but he's always so spectacular. Um, we have so many quarterbacks, you know, Penix numbers are, are remarkable. He's played at such a high level. Um, and it's, I don't want to say we take Bo Nix for granted a little bit because I don't think, you know, last year was Kenny Dillingham, this year it's Will Stein and Junior Adams. And I feel like they have, you know, been, you know, really efficient and really remarkable. He's so good at extending plays. You know, I still remember that, you know, he bailed Auburn would have been so much worse without him, you know, at that point with what he could do. Um, but I think because he's where he is, because Caleb sucks the oxygen out of all the Pac-12, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think this could be a coming out party for him, which is weird to say because he had that game that was – I, I feel like, and David, you could correct me on this because you were physically there and you've been around it a lot. But I feel like for a lot of people, that game was more about, oh, look what happened to Colorado as opposed yeah. to mm. how great Oregon actually is. And, you know, I don't think that's going to be the case this weekend. I think we're going to, this is a prove it Saturday. It doesn't mean whoever loses is out of the playoff mix, but I feel like whoever wins is probably going to jump mm. into the front of the Heisman race. Mm -hmm. You know, I just, I just think that's the way it's going to be because people are going to read a lot more into this because they're probably going to have to be pretty spectacular to do it. Cause I just don't think this game, you know, Dan Lanning's defensive pedigree aside, I don't think this game is going to be one 16 to nine. It's not going to feel like an Iowa game. Yeah. Well, let's hope not. <laughs> <laughs> oh my no, God. I don't want anything to feel like an Iowa game. I do have a dentist appointment um, next week. Um, and I think that that might feel like an Iowa I'm, game, but <laughs> I've got one this week too. I think that will, that will feel like an Iowa game. Bruce, you, you know, I, I was looking back on the box score from, from last year's game and, and it's what you remember, you know, 1100 total yards between the two of them. Right. But it's easy to forget because they, Washington's been so good under Kalen DeBoer. Washington was number 25 going into that game. That was a real prove it game for them to go win in Autzen. And do, do you feel like it's a little bit flipped in some way this year for Oregon, where we, we've all been having the conversation for a month now about Washington looks like one of the best teams in the country. Like, let's put some respect on Washington. And like you said, it sort of feels like Oregon 
might actually be the best team in the Pac-12. And this is probably the week to find out about that. Yeah, I think for, for a lot of people, because, you know, they got a feel for Dan Lanning, not just in the, in the Colorado game, but in the video after it, you know, because like, as you guys well know, when you're a coordinator, especially if you're not a guy who was a head coach and like, like a Will Muschamp who came back or, you know, Bobo, like if you're a coordinator at Georgia, you probably, people don't know much about you. They may, if you're diehard, you know, Seth Emerson fans and read Georgia all the time, but you just don't know much about Dan Lanning probably nationally. And so mm-hmm. people got a, got a good, you know, somewhat of a feel for him, you know, with the post locker room comment video that came out and certainly even some of his comments after, which I, I, you know, again, I thought there was, there was a, there was a lot of good there in it. Um, whereas Kalen DeBoer has a remarkable record. One of one of one national titles at the NAI level was a really good big 10 coordinator at, you know, at Indiana, then went to did well at Fresno and then had this remarkable first year. I feel like this is a first chance for the national audience to go, wait, who is that guy? We don't even know yeah. if that's his last name. Right. <laughs> oh, like, I mean, I think all three of us were at the uh, coaches convention last year on San Antonio. Right. And, mm-hmm. um, there's about nine different stories that could come out of this, but I'm just going to focus on this. So that, that, that uh, let's do, let's, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> so that, that coach's meeting that was in the corner where, you know, it was all kinds of stuff going on. I just remember going to that, you know, afterwards we were all kind of huddled around. I was like, all right, I got to get some FaceTime with Kellen DeBoer here just because I, I text with him, but I just not around him. Yeah. It, it's like somebody at, you remember at that point, um, he had been on the job. I don't know how long, maybe a month or something, yeah. but, but and he, you know, he had an amazing first year there and it hasn't stopped at all. Um, you know, I know from working with Chris Peterson, how much respect he has for Kalen DeBoer, but they are down, they are, you know, Seattle's obviously a big city that the program's won a national title. It's had success, but I just feel like the rest of the country, this is a chance for people to go, oh, okay, that's who that guy is. I think like, you know, you look at Lance Leipold, you look at uh, Jamie Chadwell, you look at Kalen DeBoer. I, I think one I, somebody on our staff wrote about this recently. It might have been you, Bruce. Maybe it was two. I can't remember. But I feel like there is a, a market inefficiency in bringing not just the FCS coaches, but like the lower level coaches. There's some really good football coaches coaching lower levels. Chris Kleiman. That, yeah, Chris Kleiman coming up. Like, I, I feel like there is, if you're an AD, you know, you might want to sniff around. I mean, even Mike Yersich came up through that. I, 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 there's, if you're an AD, I, I would be very curious to maybe. If, if, if the public defense attention. is this guy has won a, a ton of games in his career, like yes. that's probably a good starting point. In the yeah, major, I think, I know. think especially now, like there's always these concerns about recruiting and like, well, he's never recruited in the snake pit of whatever league or whatever this. Yeah, it's all like, his assistants have never coached in the SEC, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, but it's like there. As it, everybody wants to talk, wants to talk about, well, being a head coach is more like being a CEO than being a football coach. And it's like, well, he seems like he's pretty good at running an operation. Um, I, I feel like DeBoer is one another guy that I think will expose that a little bit. Yeah. In full disclosure, I actually think the person who wrote that the story in question might have been Stu. Um, I think it was. Yeah, I think it was. It was somebody on our staff. I remember it recently. Sound like something like, this not about wow, we probably should. <laughs> It was a couple. Um, of years you want to just like get an applause going for Stu on that one? Yeah. No. <laughs> what you're really for, Bruce? So, but look, Brian Kelly was at Grand Valley State, and yeah. what's, what's crazy is on the Brian Kelly thing, I have a cousin, and she, I believe, was Brian Kelly's first All American he ever had, because he was like coaching like women's softball and field hockey, I think, at like St. Anselm's in New England. You know, like this is a, that is another guy who people may forget this because, you know, he's been at Notre Dame, it was at Notre Dame for so long. But like there are guys like that, even Jake Dickert. I know this is his first head coaching job, but Jake Dickert, when I talked to him last year, I've coached at every level of football. And you, you know, you get an interesting perspective on it, right? Like anybody I feel like who's been around Jamie Chadwell is like, oh, yeah, that guy could coach anyone. Because you can, I thought Tennessee should have hired him personally. I'm, I don't disagree. I mean, look, they're not as good with him. Like Coastal Carolina is not looking as good right now. Like, mm-hmm. but I know, you know, again, I don't want to come back too much to that, you know, the San Antonio meeting. But I remember Jamie Chadwell does not feel like a small time guy when you're no. a, you see his presence and his personality and that. Um, you know, they're all different, di- wired differently. 
but they're all kind of, you know, Lance Leipold, man, like, you know, he, he was, he made a, he made it hard on Vandy to not hire him. I yeah. know in the interview process and they went obviously with a guy who's from, you know, who had played there and, and, you know, came from Notre Dame and it was just fit them very well. It was hard for them to go. No, but I know that when you look at what Lance Leipold did and what he's done at Kansas, especially, you know, you guys have both been around what that place was em- like. Emphasis added. Yep. Black mm-hmm. hole, black hole. <laughs> yeah, as bad as it could be. Right. And getting it after like who he got it after, you know, it was, it, I don't know if it was Beatty esque because like Beatty followed Charlie Weiss, but you know, and in the bad. college run, yeah, it was like yeah, the 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 Les Miles tenure was not not a successful tenure at Kansas. We'll call it forgettable for everyone that was not at Kansas. <laughs> How about that? I don't even know if you could say it was forgettable. Wouldn't be the word because it was like there was a lot of stuff that was eerily memorable. Um, <laughs> and super awkward. Like there have been bad coaches who were forgettable, but they were like they go away, and it just like you know so. But back on, you know, back on DeBoer and the and these guys who come out of seemingly nowhere, um, I do think there's there's a good lesson to that because they have a plan. They know what they're doing and they hit the ground running and they're really confident. And in the case of DeBoer, I got to spend time with him um, in April when I went up there. Like mm-hmm. his guys, like Ryan Grubb, Nick Saban wanted to hire Ryan Grubb to be his offensive coordinator. You know, a lot of those guys were with him when they were at an NAIA school. and. Mm-hmm. You know, one guy might have been teaching, like one guy might have been working at the local, the the local police department, you know, like it was just, hey, we got to do way more with less because we don't have this bloated staff of of 84 people, you know, doing every little detail thing.